Hi everyone and welcome to the uh, third and last uh, hour of the lectures about function secret sharing. Now, people complained about the uh, resolution of the huge video stream we had on Zoom. So in parallel, we opened uh, uh, a broadcast on YouTube. I posted on the chat channel and on Slack links to a YouTube page with uh, broadcast the lecture uh, live, and it has much better resolution. So you are all urged to move to the uh, YouTube page and keep posting your questions on Slack. And now let's go to Elette and to the last hour. Hi, right, thanks, Benny. Yes, I swear my slides aren't pixelated on their own, <laughs> nor am I. Um, before I, I pick back up for the, the final section here today, um, two questions that popped up, although now I'm not sure I remember what they were. Uh, so one of them was asking about the, the communication size or rather the share size of the, the FSS for, for point functions of the DPF construction. Um, I don't know is, is the answer. I don't know if we can do better. So right now, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the very, very end. But right now we basically have something like lambda times n, and you could hope to get possibly down as low as lambda plus n, um, which actually in, in practice makes it quite a big difference. Uh, I don't know, and I, I don't really have any lower bounds. Uh, we've tried a little bit, but we haven't gotten anything uh, hard uh, or like solid there. Um, and I don't know what the other question is. Pierre, what was the other question? Uh, yes, it was about um, malicious C generation. So ah, yes. Good. Yes, okay. So I'm basically, uh, the answer to that is I'm punting. Um, and uh, I believe that Henry will be talking about this topic in more detail. This is the part of the Poplar uh, paper that we have joint together with, with other co-authors, uh, with the private heavy hitters. So um, presumably Henry will go in further detail about that. Okay. So in, uh, in that case, let us proceed forth with, with part three. Um, which, as I mentioned, is going to be a little bit of uh, here and there. This is where I'm, I'm putting in just random stuff that I want to tell you guys about. Uh, applications and extensions. So <laughs> we actually have uh, two papers. One is function secret sharing improvements and extensions. And we have a homomorphic secret sharing paper, which I think is optimizations and applications. So this is uh, uh, actually not about either of those papers, um, but, but following in suit. Okay, so let me start with uh, an application that's a bit different from what I've been talking about, um, it, which is for secure computation with pre-processing. Okay, so we're shifting gears a bit here. Um, and let me start with uh, saying uh, just a few words about what is secure computation and what do I mean by secure computation with pre-processing? Okay, so if you guys haven't seen uh, secure computation, in this case, I'm going to be considering two parties. So think of Alice and Bob. Um, this is a setting where, where the parties have secret inputs here, X and Y, and they want to talk to each other back and forth somehow to learn some, some function F evaluated on X and Y, uh, but nothing else about X or Y, okay? Uh, so this is a beautiful line of work. It's actually a, you know, one of the, the main things that, that I work on in, in addition to function secret sharing and beyond. Um, and, uh, and over the last decade, so since the 80s, where it was shown that you can do this for any function based on certain computational assumptions, there's been a ton of work of trying to get more efficient solutions. Um, and, and one of the nice observations here, going dating back to Beaver in, in 91, is that you can consider a, a version with pre-processing, okay, where there's like this offline phase uh, that results in Alice and Bob getting some sort of correlated randomness. Uh, but this part is independent of the inputs, okay? So this you can think about running long over overnight or whatever. Then when the inputs actually come along, in the online phase, the communication uh, in some of these constructions can be very cheap and more succinct. So, so this is a nice feature where it sort of pushes work into a pre-processing phase where costs are, are more acceptable. Okay, and in such a setting, there's two obvious uh, and semi-orthogonal questions. One is what types of correlations are useful? How can you kind of use this correlated randomness? And uh, there's been bits and pieces of, of different uh, observations kind of, or, or like works showing that different types of, of correlated randomness can actually give you secure computation uh, savings in the online period. 
So it states back, of course, to beaver, if you've heard of multiplication or beaver triples. Um, a tiny tables was a recent, more recent work uh, using something called one-time truth tables. There's some other odds and ends, um, but, but kind of a sort of when, when I approach this literature, it's a little bit of like un, like a little bit of disconnected tricks. It wasn't really clear what, what's, uh, what's the, going on there. Okay, but a second question, which I'm actually not going to talk about at all, uh, is how to generate such correlations. Okay, so going back to the picture, um, in some sense, I've kind of pushed a lot of the work to the pre-processing, and it, it typically actually ends up being the case that the cost of, of generating this pre-processing, which uh, also needs communication and, and needs computation, ends up being one of the bottlenecks of, of the cost, one of the more expensive parts of the protocol. Okay, so there's a lot of motivation of potentially trying to generate these correlations, for example, with low communication or low cost. Uh, I'm not going to touch on this, but let this be a, a shout out to the talks of uh, Peter and Yuval about pseudorandom correlation generators on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, and this is exactly addressing that question. Okay, so now I, I'm pushing that to the side and let's go back to what types of correlations are, are useful here. Okay, and the basic framework of secure computation with pre-processing is that you start with the program of this function f that you want to compute, uh, and you express it as some arithmetic circuit, okay? So this kind of forces you to choose some ring, some arithmetic space that you're working over, and you've got these gates that are addition and multiplication over this ring. Okay, and for example, um, Beaver showed how can you take each of these uh, kind of multiplication gates, or the expensive ones there, and for each multiplication gate, take a, a, a multiplication triple. This is going to be generated as part of the pre-processing that allows you to, in the online part, effectively and cheaply do a secure computation of that given multiplication gate. Okay, and there, um, so, so arithmetic circuits, these multiplication gates are one example. The general truth tables, the tiny tables is kind of another example. And let me post kind of a more broad goal here. Suppose that you have a goofy looking circuit, maybe you have uh, different domains, not just, for example, ring elements, maybe for part of it you want ring elements um, to do multiplications over arithmetic space, but then you actually want the bit representations of these values, or you want to do something that's, that's much more efficient of these values and so forth. And it can be very general here. And uh, the goal for, for this part is asking, can we somehow come up with a way that's comparable to, for example, this beaver multiplication triples that takes the cost of the multiplication gate and pushes it up? Can we do that for these more expressive or, or different types of gates? Okay, and um, the punchline here is uh, yes, that function secret sharing actually gives you a tool for doing that. Okay, I'm not going to go into much detail because uh, I want to talk about all sorts of other things, uh, but the, the high level framework is that if you start with a circuit of this form, and if you have function secret sharing schemes, okay, that support uh, various classes that relate to the types of gates in your circuit. Okay, so for example, this is supposed to be like whatever this gate is here. Um, this is going to be some function class related to this gate. I'll get to that. Then putting these two together, you can compile this into a two PC protocol with pre-processing that allows you to kind of push the expensive cost of these now strange shaped gates up to the pre-processing. And uh, this, this is cool, I think, for, for two different reasons. Uh, one, at a purely theoretical level, this approach actually unifies uh, the, the list that I had on the previous slide of, of for example, multiplication triples of tiny tables, um, of uh, some of these other constructions, all of those can actually be cast exactly as cases of this framework using FSS of different kinds. Um, but even beyond that, of course, that this not only explains existing things, but this gives new solutions, new approaches um, that are very promising in terms of practical solutions for, for two PC protocols with low online communication complexity. And, and the goal is to be able to support different types of gates, things like quality or comparison or bit decomposition 
by using, leveraging the power of FSS schemes that we, we can build. As a brief aside, which I'm not going to get into deeper, um, you can certainly ask, is FSS necessary? Is this sort of uh, an overkill? Uh, or can you maybe hope to do things without it? Uh, we don't have a full answer to that, but something that we can say is that for a certain type of gate, uh, to calling it shared equality, sort of like an equality match, um, if you have optimal online communication, like we're going to be able to achieve in, in our transformation here, then this actually implies one-way functions, which in a sense does imply, um, for example, um, DPFs, which, which is the, the FSS that we use for that case. Okay, so the punchline here is that uh, it does seem to be the case that, that possibly um, for getting really cheap communication complexity for certain types of gates here, in some sense, you do need cryptographic tools that are comparable to function secret sharing. Okay, so I've, I've kind of hand waved at what are these FSS uh, classes or what are the function classes rather that are, that are relevant here. Um, and in a little bit more detail. So note that if I start with the, the circuit, the circuit is public. Okay, in particular, each, oh, I keep thinking I can click on this. Uh, each, each of these gates is also public. Nobody's trying to hide any secrets here about what the gate is, for example. Uh, so you can ask, what is, what is the function secret sharing going to be for? There's, it's to take a secret function and to split it into parts. Uh, and what it's going to turn out being is that uh, what the tool that we need will be function secret sharing for a class of functions that correspond to what I'm referring to as secret offset functions. Okay, so say for example, this is some public gate G, then the corresponding function class we want FSS for will be the class of all the uh, G of X minus R for secret values R. Uh, and I'm not going to get into, unfortunately, the details or, or, or even any sort of explanation of why is that the case. Uh, let me just say one sentence maybe, which is that the, the transformation in this protocol will, will give a protocol where basically in the online period, for every single wire in the circuit, you'll exchange exactly one value that's going to be exactly the size of whatever the, the, the payload is on that wire. So for example, if this is some ring element here, we'll exchange a ring element. If these are bits here, then for each of those, we'll exchange one bit. Okay, and, and the idea is that what we'll exchange will give us um, a share of, so we can put those together, a masked value of whatever the real uh, semantic value is that we've just evaluated on that wire. Okay, so for example, if, if you were evaluating this on our inputs in the clear and this was a zero, then what we'll end up getting is uh, the value zero, but masked by some secret uh, value R, okay? And the function secret sharing is going to play the role that when we both have inputs, a masked uh, input value, okay? Something like an X minus R, we will use, or sorry, X plus R, okay? Uh, we will use our uh, shares of this function, the corresponding function, which is the function that intuitively removes the mask, applies the gate, uh, and it in effect kind of adds the next mask on. Okay, so this is very, uh, very brief. I don't want to actually get much, okay, I really do want to get much deeper into this, uh, but I, I, I shan't um, uh, due to time. But I'm happy if anybody has questions afterward that I, I can go into further detail. Okay, but so the punchline that, that I want you to remember at least for this part, uh, is exactly that given a circuit with certain types of gates, that the FSS that you want is for the class of these offset functions. Okay, and we'll see many examples of that. Okay, so going back to, um, I, I want to basically instantiate this transformation, okay? Plugging in different constructions of FSS that we know and that we have. Okay, and let me start by going back to the very beginning of the first lecture, where I gave some simple examples of information theoretically secure FSS. Okay, so for example, if you recall, for any function class, uh, you can always just take the truth table and secret share it. Okay, this was one construction that we had. 
Uh, I also showed these low degree polynomials. Okay, remember that, that you just secret share the coefficients. These, uh, sorry, these alphas have nothing to do with the DPF alphas, but these are like the AIs, the, the secret coefficients of the polynomial. And even slightly more broadly, uh, we saw with this observation that if I have any collection of public functions, okay, and secret linear coefficients that I can also handle uh, FSS of that function class. Okay, so these are three examples of FSS constructions. And now let us see, what do these already buy us? Okay, turns out even the simple FSS of secret sharing the truth table. Uh, and remember, so, so what is the function class? I have some public gate, which is just some now described as some big truth table. Okay, and the function that we're actually splitting that we're secret sharing is that truth table, um, but where the input is is offset by some secret mask. Okay, this think about as sort of like permuting the positions of the truth table. And those of you who are familiar, that construction is exactly what's called a one-time truth table. Okay, and this is the this is the correlation that's used in, for example, tiny tables. So this is one specific instance of FSS. How about low degree polynomials? Okay, uh, also there's uh, extensions of, of the above. Okay, so for low degree polynomials, well, what's one example of a you know, beautiful low degree polynomial is multiplication. Suppose that I have a multiplication gate, it's got two inputs, okay, and um, so the so what what is the offset function here? I would take the first input minus some mask times the second input minus some other secret mask. Okay, and if you evaluate this out, this gives you some function of the public values. Okay, and it gives you certain coefficients. These coefficients are one, r two, and r one, r two. Okay, where r one and r two are some random masks. Uh, remember that if I give you FSS shares of the coefficient, sorry, if I give you additive shares of the coefficients, that actually gives you FSS of this corresponding uh, offset function, okay? And the punchline is that these are exactly Beaver multiplication triples, okay? So if, you, if you've seen multiplication triples, what is that? You've got some random ring element A, some random ring element B, and they're uh, their product, and you end up getting secret shares across two parties of those things. That's exactly the same thing as the FSS for this function class. Okay, and, and finally, even another thing that goes a little bit uh, beyond some of the, the listed examples, but for example, uh, already just applying the simple class of, of FSS gives you things like degree D gates for, uh, for relatively low D that you can expand this out as a bigger polynomial and secret share the polynomial coefficients. Uh, gives you more general things like bilinear maps uh, over different ring structures and so forth. Okay, so, so the bottom line of this slide at least is, is just kind of the observation that even using simple FSS schemes already gives you some interesting gates. Okay, but we are not done uh, because some of the, the cool things that I, you know, I focused the last entire hour on were these FSS constructions uh, that are not information theoretic, but actually build on compu computational assumptions, but give you lightweight constructions, okay? So just to recap, what do we know here? Or some examples, for example, point functions, where the key size, as we saw here, uh, oh, I didn't describe this actually. I, I got caught in a, in a sneak here. Um, the, so this, this plus log size of G is if you want to convert, if your output space is actually not bits, which is the construction that I described in the previous hour. Um, but if you want to, to switch over to a different output group, you can do that with basically one structured correction word, the final level that's of, of a slightly different structure. So this is going to push you from, uh, from bits to, to some G element, okay? Um, and Jen and Eval, we saw is still roughly n PRG evaluations. Okay, these special intervals, these are exactly the distributed comparison functions. Uh, and the cost is a less than or equal to, say, point function times two. Okay, in um, 
and general intervals, these are the sum of, of two of these special intervals. So each of these came up in, in the previous hour. And kind of just graphically, this is what they, what they look like. So special intervals are things that are one-sided. Uh, I, I described how to do less than alpha. Um, essentially, equivalently, you can do greater than. There's not really anything tricky there. OK, so these are three classes where we have uh, lightweight FSS constructions. And what does this mean in terms of the two PC with pre-processing? OK, and really, the question is asking, what are the sorts of gates that, uh, that we can support uh, such that if I take that gate functionality and look at its corresponding input offset uh, function class, that that's supported by the corresponding class of the, the FSS functions, OK? Uh, I, actually, I wish I could give these as exercises as well. These are, uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave the proving as an exercise. But for example, suppose that I have a gate that has as input some group, whatever group, okay? And the output is a bit. And so this is a very, very nonlinear function, okay? This is a very high degree, which outputs uh, whether the input value is zero. Okay, so if it's zero, then it outputs one. If it's any other element in G, then it outputs zero. Uh, so what is this? this? This without an offset looks exactly like, yes, zero is the special point. This is a one. Everywhere else is zero, okay? It's not a coincidence I've aligned this with the point functions. In fact, when you consider the offset function family of this gate, what does it mean? So I take my input and I want to subtract some R and I ask, is the input subtracted by R equal to zero? That's equivalent to saying, is this input equal to the secret value R? And this, my friends, is exactly a point function. Continuing forward, uh, so these special, these one-sided intervals give you things like, what is the sign of, uh, of, a, of an integer value? Is it positive or is it negative? Um, this, for example, is if I'm considering representations of Zn centered around zero. Uh, very similarly, if I have two inputs and I want to compare, that you can basically take the inputs, subtract them, and then do a, a sign function on that. Uh, and again, so this one takes a little bit more maneuvering, but if effectively what you're doing is you're taking a fixed public interval of sign. So this is like, I want to be, um, if I'm above zero, this should evaluate to one, otherwise it shouldn't. And it's taking that and it's shifting around by some random secret offset. And this is exactly what you're hiding with these special intervals. Okay, and okay, continuing a little bit forward, uh, even these more general intervals allow you to do things like splines, okay? So what is a spline? This, is, this represents a, a graph of a gate, okay? Uh, which splits the input space into different parts. And then each input chunk of the input has some polynomial uh, evaluated on it. Okay, so those of you who are familiar, one example of such a thing is the ReLU function. Uh, this sort of looks like zero and then uh, X. Um, and splines, and in particular, ReLU have a lot of interesting applications, for example, for approximating uh, different types of functions, you know, like trigonometric type functions or a fixed point arithmetic sorts of operations. ReLU, for example, appears very commonly as a threshold function for uh, neural networks. So there's a lot of interesting directions here uh, about trying to, to see where this can lead uh, and how to get this more efficient. Okay, so this is what I want to say about this first application of 2PC with pre-processing using FSS gates. Um, and let me stop and see if there are any questions about this part. Yes, there was one question, and this is if we can reuse the same FFS gates for multiple inputs during the online phase, where well, I think um, inputs relies here to like um, circuit gates. Uh, unfortunately yeah. not, um, and I'll explain why. So each, each of these FSS shares that I'm giving you are tied to some like random secret mask. And effectively, if you were to use the same FSS shares for two different parts of the circuit, um, uh, let me think about this. Okay, at least the, the simple version is no. Maybe there's some sort of optimization. I would need to think more about it. Uh, but at least the, the initial thing is that you can't directly reuse it because as soon as you, that, that would 
basically required that you publish two different versions uh, with respect to the same mask that are masked by the same value in order to use the, the FSS, which is tied to a fixed sort of uh, mask offset. Um, I'm not sure if that made sense. But, but that would certainly be a problem um, because if I see two different values that are masked by the same secret mask, um, I, 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 I see correlations between them. It's like using a one-time pad more than once. Uh, so, so what does it mean? That means that ultimately, um, if you have some circuit with a bunch of gates, at least how we know how to do things right now, uh, the pre-processing material will require one set of FSS keys for each gate. And that's an in really interesting direction to try to improve and, and in fact, see if you can piggyback somehow um, for, for multiple instances of, of the same gate. Uh, or, or for example, um, if you could somehow generate these, uh, these keys in some way, like a pseudorandom correlation generator for FSS keys, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to for when you guys see what pseudorandom correlation generators are. Okay, thanks. I think this is our questions for now. Great. Okay, in that case, let me totally divulge, uh, diverge. <laughs> um, there's some word I'm searching for there. Uh, and just tell you about some random cool things about FSS. Uh, so certainly feel free to jump in if there are questions. I have kind of a few different slides and then uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about other connections and then close things up with open questions. Uh, so one thing, which is something actually that a few of us has been looking at into recently. So this is a, a joint work that, that's still a manuscript together with Niven Yuval and, and a student of Yuval's, uh, Viktor Kobov, um, looking into what we call a programmable DPF. Okay, so, so recall that um, the DPF key construction that we have, it's relatively tight, it's, it's great. Um, and we, I really don't know if I can shrink it anymore. I would really love to be able to do so. Um, but one thing that you could potentially hope to do is at least to shrink it so that one of the two keys is very small. Okay, I've added this gray thing because uh, the final construction is not going to have the same structure, and maybe actually the second key will be a little bit bigger. Uh, but the ultimate question is, is can you somehow make it to one of the keys is very small, uh, but the second one is still sublinear. Otherwise, you can do, for example, just like kind of trivial approaches where one is just a PRF uh, seed and the other one is just like the truth table, um, truth table XOR. Okay, so uh, so this is this is the goal, and, and we play around with this, and and we look, we find that there's some interesting applications, and we are indeed actually able to construct such an object, uh, building very closely on something called a puncturable pseudorandom set. So this is a notion that was put forth by by Henry and Dima, uh, Corgan Gibbs and and Kogan, and their work on online offline private information retrieval. Uh, so in that work, they they get something that's almost a DPF or, or rather in the sense that it's, uh, they, they get two server private information retrieval. And it has a very similar flavor like you're kind of might imagine here where one of the servers uh, goes offline. So you can kind of think about, for example, programmable DPF. I give one, one of the servers the short key and then I don't really need to talk to him again as long as he knows regularly, okay, these, at these time checks, I need to give some uh, FSS output. And, uh, and it can go from there. So, so this online offline private information retrieval gives a scheme for, for information, private information retrieval, as you might guess, that has this kind of flavor. Um, but the reconstruction effectively is something more complex. Okay, see, just a second, let me change my audio issue here. Can you hear me? Uh, you're very low in volume. I'm very low. Was I more, was I less low before? We're good? Okay, thanks. Great. Anyway, so so what they achieve is, is, is almost there, but it's not quite uh, a DPF in that it doesn't have this sort of additive or, or linear reconstruction. Uh, and so we show that there is a way, actually, you can, you can push it and you can get all the way to a DPF. Um, and one of the things I think is very interesting that the construction in this work 
is very different from the DPF construction that I showed you in the previous hour. Um, so just kind of roughly, for example, the, the construction on, on one side or the other um, is going to be some kind of punctured histogram. So loosely speaking, each of the parties is going to, to have a bunch of pseudo random evaluations. Each of these evaluations is going to be like a ball being tossed into some collection of buckets, okay? And you'll build this so that one of the parties is missing one ball. And that's going to be exactly missing a ball in the bucket that you want to, to have the non-zero value uh, for, your, for your DPF. Um, and it turns out you can do that relatively simply. So this is this is directly going from like these puncturable pseudorandom sets. Uh, for those who are familiar, for example, I can just take a PRF and give you a punctured PRF that punctures it in one of these uh, uh, like ball values if the random outputs is, is like throwing a ball. Um, but this is not secure. Okay, it's almost secure. It's one over polynomial secure. For example, if I see a punctured histogram, I have a, a bunch of random balls in, in buckets, and now one of them I've removed a ball from, uh, this is actually changing the distribution in a way that, that is one over polynomial observable. Okay, so for example, if I have one bucket that's, that's lower than the others, it's very likely, or it's, it's more likely at least, that's the bucket that I removed a ball from. Okay, so, so this kind of uh, direct thing gives you this one over polynomial version of uh, a programmable DPF. Uh, and we also show that there's a way that you can convert this of ampl amplifying in order to get negligible probability of, of error. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of you know, different trade-offs there. Very different structure. For example, um, the cost of a single evaluation in this scheme ends up being the same, unfortunately, as the cost of, of a eval all. Um, a, but I, I think that this is a really interesting direction to follow up on, partly just because it is so different that, for example, we're, we're getting a little bit stuck uh, in the, the previous approach, this tree-based approach. So I think it's very interesting to try to explore different directions there. Uh, as I said, I'm going to be just kind of highlighting a little bit of different things. Um, this whole presentation, I've been keeping to the case where you're splitting your function into two shares, and one of the two shares is sort of corrupt, or, or that is that I'm, I'm considering the, the view of somebody who sees one of the two function shares. Okay, but uh, you can consider for sure cases where there's more than two different parties. Uh, and in particular, you can consider either just security still against one, like privacy ag against one of these shares, or against some T that's greater than one. And, uh, and let me say, so if you increase the number of parties, but you don't increase the security threshold T, then actually your, your life becomes easier, okay? Uh, so all of the, this, the, the constructions that we have carry over to those cases. For example, you can even just ignore one of the servers. Um, but there's interesting questions there about, first of all, uh, trying to get better, better constructions. For example, if you have one corruption and, and three different parties, maybe you can do something better there. Um, and, and we don't really know. For this slide, I'm, I'm addressing the question, the elephant in the room. So suppose that you want security against more than one. And the bottom line here is that what we have sort of sucks. Uh, and you can, <laughs> I suppose you can quote me on that. Uh, maybe you shouldn't, but. <laughs> um, so, so to give you an idea, um, for example, if you look at the case of uh, where we had two parties and t equals one. So actually this, this quote, this is the BGI 16. This is what we saw before. So with one corruption, we can get like n times lambda. As soon as you go even just to three parties and two corruptions, this beautiful N turns out into this disgusting two to the N over two. Uh, and let me remind you, so two to the N is like the trivial uh, truth table secret sharing con construction. So the savings here are like, instead of doing the entire truth table, you only need to do sort of square root of that, uh, but that's pretty bad. And in fact, I'm not helping my, my case here, my advertising, uh, but it even gets a bit worse. So suppose that you have M parties and you want security against N minus one of them. Our current best solution not only has this two to the N over two, but actually also an exponential term in the number of parties. 
So uh, let me leave this not as a negative, but rather this intriguing direction for, for future research. Uh, and unfortunately, mentioning, though, that this is not an, an easy question, where it seems like it's going to take certainly new ideas. Um, and, and there's a really actually intuitive reason. Why is it the case that security against one party has a, a qualitatively totally different structure in terms of what the keys look like? And just to give you a flavor of this, so for example, suppose I've got two parties and I'm secret sharing a zero between them. Okay, for example, like DPF, we want to secret share zero. Uh, if I have two parties with security against one, that means that secret shares of zero are identical values. So I know exactly what they're, what they're looking like. And for example, if I tell person number one to do some function on his share and person number two to do the same function on his share, that's going to be maintained that we keep the same share, which means that we remain secret shares of zero. As soon as you go, for example, to three parties with two clear options, even kind of loosely thinking about the secret share value. So say that, that the three of us now have some zero secret shared across us, but in order to have security against two, that already means that, that for example, say I want an additive sharing across the three of us, uh, that there's, there's so many degrees of freedom here that whatever I have, well, I only know that what you two add up to is equal to this, but sort of how that is distributed across the two of you, I don't know. In fact, it's important that it's crucial that I don't know. Uh, and this turns out to make things really much more complicated for, for trying to get correctness of, of getting these kinds of homomorphisms or, or function secret sharing schemes. And, and I should mention that this limitation carries up not only into this category of sort of lightweight constructions from one-way functions, uh, but trickles all the way through the, you know, this beautiful sky and mountain and valleys uh, of constructions that we have. And that in many cases, what we can get for, for two, two parties is much, much better than for three parties. But I should say, so there, there are some interesting things that can be done. So in fact, there's a recent work um, of, I think it's Ban Kushalevitz and, and Ostrovsky, for example, that showed that you can get some improvements if there's a gap between the number of parties and the number of corruptions. And this is leveraging some kind of uh, NPC type techniques where if you have this gap, you can kind of do like multiplication type structures, uh, but a, a bit more interesting than that. And as an example there, so say for instance, you have five parties and two corruptions. So it's this is not an M minus one, but there's a bit of a gap there. Uh, then for example, they get key size that scales is a two to the N over four instead of two to the N over two. So it's still, still a little uh, big, I would say, uh, but, but some interesting progress there. Big, you know, shifting around, sort of taking a, a turn about different topics here. Another thing I wanted to mention is, is some things that we know about how does function secret sharing relate to other cryptographic primitives and cryptographic objects. Uh, so, so I alluded to this much earlier, but in fact, we know for sure that, that certain forms of non-trivial FSS, uh, which I'm not going to define, but in particular includes things like even just for point functions or for intervals, uh, a lot of simple classes like this, that this necessitates existence of one-way functions. And even a little bit further than that, um, so we were able to show that, that if you look at the, the, the share functions, these function shares, so F0 and F1 on their own, uh, that each one of those is and must be a pseudorandom function. And sort of the intuition there is that um, if, I, if I, I'm, I have one of these functions, right? And the question is, if I could sort of predict some of the outputs of your function in different values, that would give me some bias, that would give me some information combined with what I have about what the function output would be at certain inputs. And roughly speaking, if your function is such that you should not uh, know such information, then that must mean that you, you cannot get any sort of uh, useful prediction about your, your opponent's or, or the other guy's share value. Uh, this bullet looks very contrived, okay? Uh, let me explain this. I like this bullet a lot, and I will also explain why. If you have function secret sharing for some class of functions, okay, that contains 
the uh, decryption circuit class for some symmetric key encryption scheme, okay? Then this implies some object that seems hard to get, okay? Specifically, it's some, okay, amortized, never mind that, but it gives you some sort of succinct uh, communication secure computation protocol. Okay, this, uh, in fact, I, I almost included uh, the slide from Eurocrypt 2015, which is ancient news right now at this point, uh, where I put this like big red section. This is a big barrier. This means that probably we cannot get FSS or, or comparable objects from things that don't already imply, for example, homo fully homomorphic encryption. Um, and I, I said, I, I like this bullet a lot because uh, we actually did something a little bit surprising to us at least, which was that we were able to build FSS for a class of circuits that in include these decryption circuits, namely the class of branching programs or NC1 from the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption. Uh, and what this meant was that actually for the first time, we could get something that we only knew how to do from uh, basically fully homomorphic encryption, uh, which we only knew how to build from lattices or LWE. Uh, it was the first time that we could get something comparable from, from these new mathematical structures like DDH and discrete log type assumptions. So, so I'm putting that out there, uh, not so much as like, a, oh, this is a hard, hard barrier, but rather maybe this is, maybe this is a barrier or maybe this is a, an interesting opportunity. Um, another object, so something called a privately puncturable PRF. Okay, so um, a punctured PRF without the, this privacy roughly is a pseudorandom function where given a, given a master key that allows you to evaluate the pseudorandom function on any values, you can generate kind of a handicapped key that punctures out one input. Okay, so I can give you a punctured key, which lets you evaluate the pseudorandom function on all inputs except for some, some special X store. Okay, a privately puncturable PRF is one where when I give you this punctured handicapped key, not only does it have the, the right correctness uh, properties, but also you do not know which is the point that was punctured. So the privacy here is about the, the punctured point. Okay, maybe this already sounds uh, a little, little you know, connected. Uh, and in fact, this notion of this object of privately puncturable PRFs imply DPFs and they imply even a stronger version with some sort of adaptive property um, in the sense that, that, for example, if I take the master key to this PRF, that will be one of my, my DPF shares. And that is independent of the point that I want to puncture. There, sorry, the point, the, the DPF point, the special point alpha, okay? Then once I learn what alpha is, I can actually at that point generate the second share, um, which is like the, the, the privately puncturable PRF, which is punctured at the point, the special input alpha, okay? And you can kind of, uh, it takes a little bit of work that, that gives you a random value instead of exactly one at that point, but, but that's, uh, that can be handled. And actually an, another aside here. So this structure seems to already give a construction of DPF where one key is very short and the other one is some kind of punctured key, uh, which I mentioned was, was a, like a goal of this programmable uh, DPF. And, and indeed this, this does give such a thing. The goal of, of the programmable P DPF construction, the slide that I mentioned was to do this using just one way functions and, and light cryptographic techniques. Uh, so privately puncturable PRFs exist. There, there are various constructions of it, um, but all of them use a public key assumption. So things like LWE, for example. Uh, so the last bullet on, on this page, at least, is a new one that I just recently learned about, uh, something called targeted lossy functions. Uh, so th this one's really out there, but uh, if you guys have heard of uh, lossy trapdoor functions, this is some sort of weaker variant it was recently put forth by Willie Quash and Daniel Wicks and, and Brent Waters. Um, and, and sort of weaker in the sense that there's there's like only, okay, never mind. I'm not even gonna, I'm not going to define what any of these things are, uh, but I will give you the pointer and it turns out, so I was, I was in the talk of Daniel the other day, 
Uh, and it, he was telling me about, well, telling everybody in, in the talk, including myself, about what are these things, what, how are they useful, what are the constructions, and then at the very end, he said, oh, and by the way, we found out afterward they're equivalent to DPFs, and this was a, a twist I was not expecting, uh, and I think it's very interesting. So, so they end up giving a construction of something, and, and kind of in retrospect, the construction does look very similar in flavor uh, to our DPF construction, the tree-based thing. Uh, and apparently the, the two notions are, are equivalent. And it actually seems like an, an interesting point of, of looking forth uh, into to see if there's anything beyond that that, that can be said. Um, another thing that I want to mention, and, and I'm starting to kind of close up a little bit here, is that, uh, so I've talked about FSS as having potential maybe for applications, for example, uh, private uh, private uh, querying to databases, private writing, and so forth. Uh, and I want to put a little bit of facts behind my words here, um, that there have been some, at this point, uh, an assortment of systems that have been built on top of, of function secret sharing, or I've used that as a, an important tool. And I want to, to call out some of them uh, and then list some of the other ones. Um, so this one here, Repost, this is back in, in 2015. Uh, this is a, a way of using function secret sharing to get anonymous broadcasting. And very loosely what they do is they, they take exactly the structure of uh, this private histogram incrementing type of thing. So think about that there's this big list of, of slots, okay? And it starts that all the slots are empty. So these slots, the, the message values are held secret shared across two different servers, okay? And now to, to broadcast a value anonymously, a client comes along and chooses a random slot in which to write his message. Okay, and this is implemented by taking a DPF where the payload is equal to the message and the secret input, like the special input, is just a random number of from the slots. Okay, so one client uh, basically now has a secret sharing of his message and say, slot number five, another client comes, chooses another random slot, secret shares his message. Many, many, many people come along, okay? Then after many messages have been placed, then the, the servers can take their secret shared data, like uh, secret shared values and bring them together. What everybody learns now is just kind of the union of what were all of the messages, but the connection between which message came from which client is broken. That's protected because of the privacy of, of the DPF. Okay, and they showed how the, they built the system with actually you know, millions of users uh, and so forth. A splinter, so this is, this is a system uh, <laughs> uh, that, they, that implemented some of these, these private queries. Uh, so it was effectively some sort of private Yelp clone. It, for those who know, this is for, for ratings for restaurants in the US, uh, flight search and map routing. The queries that they implemented were kind of an interesting range of things. So match, range queries, max min, top K, uh, with relatively efficient latencies. For example, the Yelp-like thing had 40 different cities worth of restaurants and New York City traffic map, which is, which is pretty legitimate. Uh, and something that's kind of interesting here is that they actually built, a, so they were able to kind of modify and they had the servers do some local computations that allowed them to support queries even a little bit beyond what classes of functions we have FSS for. So this is a nice, uh, another position where, where there's some kind of building that can be done there. I mentioned this one also brief, uh, briefly before. So this is like the DPF competition to ORAM. Uh, actually, I'm also, I like ORAM a lot as well. This is Oblivious RAM, which Gilad is going to be talking about. Um, but uh, in this, this work, 2017 CCS paper of Donner and Shalat, they showed a kind of surprising result, which is that in the case of two-party secure computation, okay, where the program that you want to, to execute is not a circuit, actually, but it's expressed as a RAM program. Okay, so the, the, you know, this is very motivated to be able to support two PC of these kinds of programs directly without needing to take the RAM program and, and you know, unroll it to this uh, gigantic circuit. Uh, and the standard sort of approach for doing this uh, is that you you have is an additional layer because you need to protect 
where the say, so say you have like some public database or even secret shared data secret shared uh, information across the, the two different parties. And one of the things that you need to do is make sure that where you're looking at positions of this this memory tape or, or database are not revealing information about the values that you're interested in or the values that are actually written there. Uh, and this layer is, a, is typically done by putting a layer of oblivious RAM. And you'll see more about that uh, in a future lecture. Um, it, but it turns out so that even though oblivious RAM, as I said, has relatively much, much lower asymptotic uh, cost for, for, for the lookups. Okay, so for example, if I want to actually look up some item, there's some overhead of additional items that I need to look up in order to maintain security. And ORAM only requires you to look at something like log the database size, many additional entries, okay? Versus something like a private information retrieval. Here I can view this as like a, a never mind how, but, but in general, private information retrieval requires you to touch everything, every single one of the database items and do some computation to compress down. And at first glance, that looks ridiculous. Okay, obviously the log over log overhead is going to be much better than the linear overhead. Uh, and what they ended up showing is that because the, the actual decision of which, which are the log positions that you're going to look at, that's, that's something that needs to be kept secret. So that needs to be emulated via a small scale secure computation. That that pr pr procedure of deciding is much more complicated for oblivious RAM schemes that we have than it is for uh, private information retrieval based on this DP DPF schemes, which are relatively uh, simple, like these, these generation procedures of splitting the function. Uh, and what that ended up being is that it, despite the, the huge gap in, in the wrong direction for the asymptotic complexity, that concretely, when you're doing this secure two-party computation, it's actually much better uh, to use DPF-based private information retrieval instead of oblivious RAM. So for example, um, as long as your database is not too big, where you know at some point the asymptotics will take over, but they showed, for example, if your database is less than around two to the 30 entries, um, then you can get a lot, actually, a surprising amount of, of improvement in, in things like the time and the memory and the initialization costs of these schemes. In fact, I should uh, I should mention this paper, this donor Shalat, CCS 2017, was the best paper of CCS that year. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go through the rest of them in, in great detail. I, I actually even discovered a few new ones uh, while making these slides. Um, but what I want to convey here is that there's a lot of interesting uh, use cases, that there's a lot of potential, there's even more different cases. Just to, to sort of highlight, for example, where, is, where uh, are DPFs or other forms of FSS being used? So for example, private scent intersection, Benny will talk about that uh, later on in, in uh, maybe not about this topic, but he will talk about private set intersection later in this school. Uh, private contract uh, contact tracing, uh, encrypted search systems with distributed trust. Uh, Poplar is a work actually I'm joined on um, with co-authors. I think Henry will be talking about this later, right after this talk. Um, uh, things with uh, private time series database, high bandwidth anonymous broadcast, for example, the spectrum things as a follow-up of a post looking at, at improvements there. Private nearest neighbor search. Uh, the bottom line is that there's a lot of really interesting directions. And, and, and for me personally, this is very exciting to see uh, that, that this tool, which kind of in of itself is this, in my, my, my mind, like this, this very simple and, and kind of beautiful primitive, that it can have potential applications to, to the real world and, and in all sorts of different domains. Okay, so I've uh, done my, my mini rambling of this section, uh, and I want to summarize and conclude with some open problems. So, so first of all, what, what did we see together? Okay, so we had these three hour talks. In the first talk, remember, uh, we talked about what is the definition of function secret sharing, uh, and this class of applications to two server private database queries and updates. Okay, so as an example, a special case of this is two server private information retrieval, 
But for different types of FSS, and, and in fact, even still for DPFs, uh, you could push this much broader than just a like index i is the item that I want to read or that the, that I want to in, uh, to increment, for example. And there's all sorts of different things that you can do there. And uh, like a high level version of what are the FSS schemes that we have? Well, in general, there's there's this trade off between richness versus complexity. Uh, so the richness of the function class that you can support versus the complexity of the type of cryptographic machinery that you need and the overall uh, efficiency that you that we can get. So these uh, our 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 talk was focused on this class of uh, different types of simple functions, things like point functions, like distributed uh, comparison functions, and so forth. These are things that you can get lightweight constructions from any pseudorandom generator. Moving even up, there's these NC1 constructions. Um, I would say that these are kind of getting reasonable, uh, but they do use public key cryptography. So if you have some instance where you want to, or you need to support a richer function class, this, this can be feasible, but it's still much more expensive. Uh, and above, like you can get everything, it sort of follows from forms of fully homomorphic encryption, but, but that's a bit less interesting. In the second part, we went over constructions in detail of uh, the distributed point function and useful properties, and also this uh, add-on for distributed comparison function. And I sort of briefly discussed a little bit about FSS for decision trees, which allows you to extend a bit further. And in this final part, so I mostly was focusing on this uh, application of using FSS in order to get constructions of two PC with pre-processing uh, for different types of circuit gates and other highlights. So for example, this notion of programmable DPF where well, one of the keys is, is very small and kind of be, you know, choose your bits and then put them to the side. Multi-party DPF where you have more than one corruption and a little bit about the intuition, why is this challenging and what is the state of the art there? Uh, and relation to other different primitives in addition to places where, where uh, there are you know, FSS schemes in practice and implementation. Okay, as, as I mentioned, I want to close up with a few open questions, some of the things that we don't know. Uh, and I would love to, love to get answers to some of these questions. So roughly speaking, I've put it in a few categories. Um, so for example, suppose you stick with one-way functions, um, trying to get richer classes of functions. Uh, so, for example, can you go beyond DPF and, and DCF? Can you do something like um, certain types of formulas, CNF formulas, DNF formulas, maybe? Uh, this barrier, the, this was the bullet that I said I liked a lot, where if you have um, a FSS for a, a function class that includes the, the, the decryption circuit for a symmetric key encryption scheme that implies something tricky, well, in particular, that, that kicks in, for example, around uh, if you have FSS for, for the class AC0 or, or higher, that basically for AC0 or, or higher or more complex, there's sort of reasonable assumptions um, that give you symmetric key encryption whose decryption circuit is in that corresponding circuit class starting around AC0. Uh, but for example, there's, there's this gap in between and, and, and already I, you know, I should learn that at this point, the pseudo barrier might uh, might not actually be a barrier after all. It might just be an exciting new way of getting succinct, secure computation from different assumptions. Um, moving forward, so these multi-key things with multiple parties, three server FSS with security against two servers, even in this case, you know, the beat, the, the key that size that you need to beat is really not so great. This lambda times two to the n over two versus roughly lambda times n. Um, a, for, for both of these things, trying to show lower bounds or further barriers, these are also interesting directions. For the FSS constructions that we have, trying to see, it, can you push the efficiency anymore? And this is really motivated. Uh, I mentioned this before. For example, suppose that you can even cut the key size of DPF by a factor of two. I would be fascinated by that. Uh, and this would already give you a times two savings in, in a range of applications. On the other hand, can you potentially prove some sort of lower bound or barrier that you actually need something like this? Uh, and, and this is not clear. So upfront, for sure you need at least lambda bits for security and you sure need at least uh, n bits even just to, to describe 
the function that you're trying to secret share. Uh, but there's no reason why you need lambda times n as opposed to something like lambda plus n. Um, so I, I described the construction for a single point function. Turns out, and you'll see this uh, in the pseudorandom correlation generators section, turns out there's actually a lot of motivation for trying to do FSS for what we call multipoint functions. So instead of having all zeros in a single one, there's, you know, like a sprinkling, a few ones, maybe there's 20 ones. So you can always do that by taking 20 totally independent uh, copies of, of DPFs and sort of just adding them together. And you can do a little bit of savings by kind of piggybacking on, on common uh, tree structures. Uh, but it really gives you something that's that's only comparable to something like 20 <laughs> times overhead. Um, and so we, we sort of have solutions. You can put some stronger machinery onto it and you can get some savings, uh, things like batch code and cuckoo hashing, if you guys are familiar with these things. If not, then never mind. Um, but uh, but there's a lot of motivation in particular for even 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 if I can't beat the DPF key size for a single DPF, I would still be very happy if I could beat uh, like this amortized cost that instead of uh, 20 times the cost for 20 points that you could do much better than that. Okay, and, and I didn't really talk about these mid-level constructions, these things from DDH or from Palier and so forth. Um, there's a whole range, you know, this, this could be another three hour talk, you know, just talking about some of those things. So there's a lot of really uh, interesting directions. Uh, new and improved applications. This list is growing day by day. Uh, it's really, really exciting to see. And, and overall, kind of just, just closing everything up here, I think, uh, as I mentioned, this, this seems like a very natural, fundamental kind of topic. Uh, and I'm just really excited to see where is this going to go uh, and open up even new directions in the future. And so this one thing I didn't even talk about is that, um, you know, kind of a path I didn't talk at all about malicious parties, really. I just teased you with one or two sentences and then told you Henry will, will answer your questions. Um, but for example, even looking at, in that direction led us to uh, different notions of, of uh, proving on secret shared data uh, that ends up having applications to, you know, um, zero knowledge compilers for multi-party computation protocols with low communication. There's a whole lot of thing, this, this topic, uh, I started in this topic as a, as a fresh postdoc. Actually, I got pulled in because I had works with punctured PRFs, which ended up not really giving a direct solution. Um, but uh, but since then, it's it's exploded and it's such you know fantastic different directions, and it's been a really fun ride. So let's see what, what happens, and I hope that you guys uh, solve these problems and you tell me about them. Hey, uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, it was a you know wonderful you know three-hour lecture on this topic, and at least for me, it made uh, many things uh, much clearer and opened uh, quite a few things to to explore. So, thanks a lot, uh, and we're going to post this on YouTube, and I'm I'm sure that many people will find this uh, valuable. Uh, if people have more questions. Uh, you can post them on the Slack channel and Elet will probably see them later. Uh, and so thank you everyone. And we'll meet, meet again uh, in an hour and a half. So uh, uh, bon appetit for lunch or dinner or whatever, breakfast, and we'll see you again.